All right, friends, I'm here with a new friend, uh, Abigail Favale, or Favale, if I can. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That's my, yeah, that's the extent of my Italian uh, accent. Um, Abigail, we have a mutual friend, um, Lance Teal, who his, uh, two of his kids have gone through your uh, your school, and I uh, I think you you taught them personally, right? Like, Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 definitely. Two brilliant kids. Lance is a hoot. Hello, Lance. A little shout out to Lance if you're listening. <laughs> Um, but, uh, I, yeah, he connected us and said, Hey, you got to talk to Abigail. Cause Abigail has been like, like researching and thinking through gender theory type stuff for a long time. And that obviously intersects the work that I've been doing more recently. So, um, thanks so much for being on the show. I'm so stoked to talk to you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. So why don't we just give, yeah, give a background of who you are. Cause you have a really interesting, very unique kind of, uh, academic slash spiritual journey. So, and it really does make a difference to understand that as we dive into kind of th- questions about gender theory. So yeah, tell us, mm-hmm. uh, sure. tell us a bit about that interesting background. Yeah. Let me, I'll give you a brief sketch. And okay. then if you're, if you want to dive into any part of it in more depth, just let me Perfect. know. But yeah, so I'm, I'm actually an Idaho native. So I was yes. born in McCall. And I mainly grew up in Utah and Eastern Idaho in the Mormon belt. Um, And I was raised evangelical, an evangelical Christian. And I went to George Fox, where I currently teach, and I'm the dean of humanities here. Um, And when I was in college, I got really interested in feminism. So feminist philosophy and feminist theology. I was a philosophy major. And then um, after college, I went on into graduate school in literary studies, but I was focusing on feminist theory and literary studies and gender theory. So I have a master's degree in women's writing and gender theory. And then my, my doctorate focused on feminist theory and literature, women's literature. So, um, for about a decade in my twenties, I was really immersed in this world that I guess I usually call postmodern feminism. It's hard to label. Uh, but Um, I, feminism and and gender theory had pretty much kind of become my religion. And I had, even though I still considered myself a Christian, I had really adopted the worldview that's implicit in a lot of those theories without necessarily consciously realizing it. Um, And eventually that led to a faith crisis at the end of my twenties. And I really suddenly became Catholic. So (laughs) I've been Catholic now for about seven years and that really totally shifted my my worldview. Okay. And for the first couple of years, I thought, oh, oh my gosh, I've like wasted my education. How can I somehow like reconcile all mm. this, you know, decade long immersion in feminist and gender theory with my my new Catholic Christian worldview? Yeah. Um, but once the dust settled, I began to realize that it was an asset to have this kind of insider knowledge. And then to be able to really think deeply about gender and sexuality mm-hmm. um, from a Catholic perspective, but also with a knowledgeable insight of um, the the kind of secular discourse on those topics. So okay. that's where I'm at yeah. now. I, I've written quite a few essays on that. Um, I have a book coming out with Ignatius Press on gender that does kind of a deep dive on this stuff. And that'll be mm-hmm. out in the spring. So... Yeah. Next spring. Okay. Oh my gosh. I would love to get a hold of that. Um, okay. Yeah, I'll get you, I'll stoked. get you a, I'll get you an advanced copy. Awesome. So, so when you say postmodern feminism, I mean, the big name that comes to my mind is like Judy Butler. Uh, is that, sure. yeah. is she kind of like the godmother of all of that? Or is she just more, the more popular ones? Um, I always think like, she seems like the Michelle Foucault of like <laughs> oh, postmodern totally gender is, yeah. stuff. Is that, Absolutely. is that accurate or? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I call her like the fairy godmother of gender theory, basically. (laughs) And um, so I was more, I was familiar with Butler, because if you're doing gender theory at all, you just you read Butler, she's, she's the, the, the the canon really is kind of rooted in her stuff. So, uh, but I was really more interested in French feminist theory. So I read Butler, but, you know, I wasn't totally on board with all of what she thought. Um, But yeah, so I guess in saying postmodern feminism, what I mean by postmodernism is a belief that our reality is shaped by language and our reality is socially constructed, right? So I held on to this belief that somewhere out there, there's some kind of divine reality, but we can't really have access to it, right? So for me, it was not 
a reality that actually speaks to us, that reaches down to reveal himself to us, right? It was just cut off. Mm. And so all we have are our own words and stories to try to imagine or um, access that divine reality that was always out of reach. Mm. Um, So I wasn't as radically socially constructivist as, say, Butler, but I definitely had absorbed that, that view that Okay. Truth, maybe it exists, but it's ultimately unknowable. And so all we really have are the stories we tell ourselves and huh. um, our world. So truth, what we think of as truth, what we think of as reality, what we think of as gender, all these things are ultimately constructs of language and they can be reshaped. Do you see, I mean, as you're talking, I'm thinking that sounds like about 80% of young people I talk to today who have never even heard of Judy Butler. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. Is that... What I, I guess my question is, are the popular versions of that kind of more way more academic intellectual way of thinking, do you see that have do you, has that kind of trickled down and embedded itself in just the popular mindset of many people today? If that's a right Absolutely. way. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think, yeah, that's exactly the phrase I tend to use, like trickle down Judith Butler. So huh. most people will have or will use language that reflects this worldview um, even without ever having read Judith Butler or Michel yeah. Foucault, but their their understanding of reality um, of basically that reality is and what we think of as truth is a matter of power, right? So who has social power creates reality and uses language in such a way that g- shapes our understanding of reality. And there's so there's something that's true about that, right? Sure. So I think our perception of reality is very profoundly shaped by language. Mm-hmm. But what I think that Butler and Foucault don't is that reality pushes back. So our language can be out of step with reality, right? So there actually is a real, there's there's a reality that we have to reckon with. So it's not Mm -hmm. just completely arbitrary. So that's, but yet there is, so I think there's something very, very important that we need to think about in terms of how we use language. And I think a lot of young people that I speak with they just kind of adopt the the popular lingo, right, that you see on social media mm-hmm. or in whatever social circles that they're a part of. And what they often aren't aware of is um, what worldview is being imported in that language and that is actually shaping their understanding of reality, maybe without them being consciously aware of it. Yeah, yeah. No, that's super helpful. I, I uh, Just as you're talking, I, a few years ago, I read for the first time, embarrassingly, uh, uh, 1984 by George Orwell and just the um, how, how, yeah, recreating reality, uh, by just coming up with new terms or, you know, um, or just changing the past by current language almost, you know, and, and you see it, I don't know, like, and I'm always nervous about people giving sweeping statements or we're facing this dystopian, you know, apocalypse, whatever. Sure. But man, it was a little eerie. Like a lot of the stuff I read in that book, I'm like, gosh, I see that happening a lot today. Just in how people will project their worldview or their ideology or what the way they want to see reality by using certain terms. And it's like, well, that's not what that word means. Or, you know, like mm-hmm. yeah. you're, 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 you're using that term a certain way, but it's just not, I don't know. It's just like, it doesn't all like reflect reality or at least, I don't know. It's, it's tricky. Yeah, and but. I think that's why there's so, especially when it comes to the realm of gender, there's so there's so many battles over language, right? Mm-hmm. And it's because that, I and this is not. I think maybe there are some activists who are really conscious of what they're doing, mm-hmm. right? That they are really consciously trying to reshape our understanding of what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman. Mm-hmm. But I think there are a lot of people who are just acting at goodwill, and they think, oh, this is now the loving way to speak, right? But I think the reason there is so much attention on pronouns and language and labels and names um, is because there is this attempt to manipulate um, mm-hmm. pretty concrete realities and, and facts about yeah. biology and bodies, but to take um, yeah. to take this discussion out of the realm of the body and make it about language. Yeah. Well, okay, so let's let's dive in there. I'm mean, I'm just itching to dive into this conversation okay, with you because because for me, like I um you know I've been wrestling with gender within the context of the trans conversation for a while now and um you know i I feel like half of what i try to do is very pastoral and relational the other half is really trying to break down and understand concepts and i've just never been one to want to separate those two Um, i think understanding the concepts well helps you to love people 
more thoroughly and you know people that are just bent on loving people they're like oh don't give me all this philosophical stuff i'm exactly, like but yeah. you're gonna you know that that book when helping hurts you may try to be helping people but if you really don't understand the concepts you can't really do that well so I, i've been trying to merge the conceptual and relational aspects of the conversation mm-hmm. um together and part of that it's like you can't even you can get hung up on just the meaning of sex and gender and few people I know can even get, get past that. Mm -hmm. So we know in common parlance today, the term gender is different than sex. Okay. We've separated sex and gender. Sex is biological sex. There's little credible debate about that. I think Um, we can get into intersex, but let's just leave Mm -hmm. aside for those who don't have an intersex condition you know male and female are the two categories of biological sex homo sapiens are a sexually dimorphic species these are not debated Mm -hmm. they're not debated by anybody you'd want operating on you in the er (laughs) Um, (laughs) although everything's in a sense debated but um and and since the 70s people will say well that's sex but gender is different than sex i'm okay okay cool what's gender and that's where the discussion pretty much just gets lo- gets stuck this this if we're going to separate the term sex from gender and th- then what is the definition of gender and can you use that in a way that's very consistent as you reflect on what it means to be human and i honestly right. have read so your essay that you sent me is one of the clearest articulations of this whole thing that i've ever read which is why i'm so mm-hmm. stoked to have you on so anyway um I have so many questions. I don't know how to boil it down. Um, how do you define gender in distinction? Right, okay, sex? Yeah. Well, let's start there. <laughs> yeah. So that this is that's such a good question because gender has so many different meanings right now, right? Yeah. So, um, in the mid twentieth century, gender entered the scene in the social sciences and humanities in the academy, and it and in feminist theory, and it began to take this meaning. So you have biological sex. But then you also have cultural expressions of biological sex. And those those expressions can vary from culture to culture, from historical period to historical period, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, for example, right now, like, I have long hair. You have short hair, right? It's mm-hmm. not because my hair grows longer because I'm a female, right? But, you know, we're, we're kind of reflecting some of the cultural expressions mm-hmm. of what it means to be male and female. And so um, feminist theory kind of caught on to this idea and what's called the sex gender split. So gender refers to those social and cultural baggage, basically, that's applied to biological sex. And there's something that's helpful in that distinction, Mm -hmm. um, because like I said, there's some truth to that. But I think ultimately, using two different terms to separate those two things has led to where we are now, where the gender has become almost totally detached from sex, right? Right. So here's another definition of gender. Um, So you'll often hear this maybe in um, trans narratives or trans activists um, that gender is, or gender identity is this innate sense of one's gender, right? Now, first of all, that's a circular definition. So that's a problem. But leaving that aside, it's almost like this, it's this disembodied kind of state of the psyche or the soul, right? So if you, if you feel like you're a woman, then that is your gender, your gender is a woman. So there's almost this essentialist narrative there. Mm -hmm. Um, And then there's the more Butler attitude. So Mm -hmm. Butler would not be essentialist, like she would reject this idea that your soul is um, gendered or the idea of a soul at all. So for her, gender is purely a social script that we unconsciously enact and perform that creates the illusion of something essential. Um, So uh, yeah, so for her, it's a complete social construct. So those are three very different meanings, right? Um, And one, one interesting development that I think has happened since Butler is, so say like second wave feminist theory, sex is biological, gender is cultural. And for Butler, she... She also said, no, sex itself is a social Mm -hmm. construct. The idea of sex is also socially constructed. And you see that language now um, Mm -hmm. all over the place. This is an example of trickle down Butler, where you have people talking about, well, what was your assigned sex at birth, right? right? So using the word assigned makes it seem like it's this 
social, like arbitrary social imposition that you're assigned right. a sex at birth rather than your sex is re- recognized um, at right. birth. So that's one reason why it's really hard to talk about gender because you have people using a term that means very different things, right? So, yeah. and some of them are almost opposite meanings, right? The idea of gender being this kind of state of the psyche or the soul versus gender being a complete social construction, those are mm-hmm. pretty hard to reconcile. Right. Um, so that's part of why there's so much confusion. Um, and I do think that the confusion originated once you separate the idea of gender from the body, right? Because mm-hmm. the body is a very concrete, material, factual entity. Like you just, it has some givens to it, right? right? right. But as soon as you detach what it means to be a man and a woman from sex, then gender begins to take on these these very different kinds of meanings. Right. And it's constantly shifting meaning. It's like this it's postmodern juggernaut of a word that's yeah. just constantly changing. Well, but one thing I've... I've done frequently. It's actually it's actually kind of entertaining. It also can be a little frustrating, but when I read books by really smart people, people who I may even like resonate with, when they define they, they often, you know, sex is different than gender, then they say gender means and they'll give the definitions, you know, the internal sense of oneself as male, female, both or neither. Um, then you have gender roles, gender expression, which typically, you know, cultural expressions of masculinity, feminine. They'll give the definitions up front. But then the rest of the book, what I do mentally, or sometimes if I'm bored enough, I'll write it in. I'll cr- Every time I use the word gender after that, I'll cross it out and I'll put in their definition. It's it's uh, hilarious. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like Interesting. one's internal sense of one, you know, of gender. Like you said, okay, so one's internal sense of one's internal sense. Well, that's just, that's like right. yeah, look, putting two mirrors opposite each other. It's just like, where does that end? One's internal sense right. of one's, in, you know, um, or even like they're assigned gender at birth. It's like, well, no. I think you mean assigned sex. Assigned no no doctor right. in the history of medicine ever says congratulations. It's a masculine, you know. Like, right. <laughs> congratulations. Your the internal sense of your kid is this. Like that, you know. Exactly. So even so, yeah. part of the confusion, and I think it's not just an academic confusion or whatever. I think it actually ends up trickling down and and confusing and ultimately hurting people. I think is when we is when gender is separated from sex. But then when it's convenient, you will use gender in this kind of ghost like you'll you'll borrow category ontological categories yes. from sex without even Yes. Like yeah, you know, exactly. e- even like so like ma- so we Homo sapiens are sexually dimorphic. That's mm-hmm. Earth is round and not flat fact. Um and male so we need terms to describe that sexual dimorphism. Male and female are pretty widely accepted. Let's just stick with those. Right. And then people will say, well, sex is different than gender. Okay. I, I, can, I can appreciate a lot of, of, of that distinction. But then don't use male and female when you're talking about gender. Right. <laughs> right? Right, is right. that is that a legit? Am I missing something there? No, like once you're... you d- d- separate the two and bar and start swapping categories out, then that gets really confusing. Right. It doesn't work. Like separating them out doesn't work. Right. So if you, you know, if you say, um, you know, my, my gender is, or gender is one's internal sense of say being a woman. Well then what, what's the, what's the word woman there? Like what would define that for me? Right. Because if your gender is contingent upon that, that category existing, like that's something you're identifying as, or you feel that you are, well, what is that, right? And then eventually it always comes back to, well, a woman is an adult human female, right? And what does it mean to have a sense of oneself as a female? Because male and female, these are reproductive terms. These are bodily terms. These, right. So it doesn't make sense to have this completely disembodied definition. But you're exactly right. There's so much slippage and confusion of terms. And mm. Um, I see it all the time. I mean, I see it even in just things like HR training, you know, these HR compliance training things you have to take. And I, I'll actually like take like screenshots, you know, and text them to people like, what is going on? Um, but yeah, there, and the last one that I took, there was something where they define sex and gender. They offer these definitions and then they proceed to not even use the definitions that they gave correctly. It's, you know, there's just, yeah, it drives me nuts. Yeah. It's very imprecise, very confusing. And then it just... I think it leads to so much confusion um, yeah. because 
even the people who are supposed to know what they're doing don't know what they're doing. And then, so of course, you know, you've just got, you know, you've got people in a real stage of life where they're trying to figure out who they are and they never feel like they fit quite in their, in the right box. And so they, they latch onto this language and then it it kind of just blows open the idea of identity altogether. And I think it, it wreaks a lot of havoc. I'm also concerned with how, and this is where gender critical feminists, I I think have a point um, and and, uh, many other people that these kind of older sexist, culturally driven stereotypes are implicitly being resurrected and given a real foundational lens through which we consider what it means to be human very implicitly um not consciously i don't think maybe um with a lot of this slippage of terminology so if somebody says you know biologically i'm i'm male okay that's um but my the internal sense of myself is 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 female um, and if you were to ask, like, what is that? How do you know that? What do you mean? Like, exp- like mm-hmm. e- explain right. to me what that looks like without tapping into gender, these stereotypes. <laughs> it's kind of almost, it's kind of hard to it. do it. And, 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 and I'm absolutely not like, th- this is not, I'm thinking on a conceptual level right now. So this is, this wouldn't sure. be that my yes. pastoral approach because people yes. are just trying to figure out. Absolutely. Oftentimes dysphoria or, or mm-hmm. just there's all, so much relational stuff here that would need to be worked out. But just on a conceptual level, if somebody says, well, I, I feel or my internal sense is is a woman, that very idea has disconnected the concept of woman from a from a body. And, and, and mm-hmm. I think it inevitably has to rely on stereotypes of what it means to be a woman. Because if you explain Absolutely. what that internal sense looks like, it's just, right. I, I don't know how, I've never seen anybody do that without tapping into stereotypes. Anyway, I'm talking too much. Am I, this is me thinking out loud or asking a question out loud. Am I missing something? Is that, um, yeah, I think if there, or? if the ground of what it, of manhood and womanhood is not the body, then it, it, there's no other ground except stereotypes. And that's an irony that I see in this new wave of trans inclusive feminism is that it's actually incredibly regressive when it comes to stereotypes. So now we're the the kind of politically correct thing to do is to look at, say, a little boy who loves to play with my little ponies and think, oh, maybe he's really a girl, you know, and so that whatever like feminist credentials I still have, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. (laughs) So first of all, playing with my little pony is, is, does not make you a girl, right? Mm -hmm. Like there are plenty of girls that are gender atypical. There are plenty of boys that are gender atypical. Most people are pretty complex and there are very few people who fit these, these really narrow, um, stereotypes Mm -hmm. that are of idealized masculinity and femininity. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is that this new, this new wave of, of gender has a very regressive identity. Um, definition of manhood and womanhood. So now, you know, if you don't comply um, with traditional femininity, then, oh my gosh, you might really be a man. Right. And that's right. 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 um, Yeah. And sometimes, you know, sometimes I'll talk to um, folks who are more conservative and who are worried about this, um, like say my dad, you know, Um, and he'll say something. He's like, Ooh, you know, you gotta make sure to dress your girls in pink and your boys in blue. (laughs) And I'm like, I'm thinking like, dad, that's part of the problem, right? Yeah. I mean, this is, that's almost just a mirror image of what's going on. Um, yeah. In fact, like we shouldn't be color coding our kids, like, right. you know, let them. And that's what's, that's one thing that I love about if we really root the idea of gender in the body, it's actually very freeing. Right. Like I can have a wide range of interests as a woman. I can be really into sports if I want to. Right. I can also, you know, be really into, you know, watching The Bachelor or whatever. Like both those things can be true. And it's not as though I'm like, oh, I'm playing basketball. I'm a man right now, you know, yeah. or I'm like digging a hole like, oh, I'm suddenly a man, you know, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. And and then like, oh, I'm cooking like I'm now a woman that yeah. just, you know, and it really doesn't make any sense. But if we root if if my femininity is basically the living out of my sex, then anything that I do is a feminine task or a feminine action. Huh. Right. Like because it's the body, it's the person that brings that kind of, um, that accent to things that are, that are masculine and feminine. Um, yeah. 
I, I we don't need to just keep agreeing with each other, but my, I just can't tell you how much I this is helpful because you bring such a level of scholarship and knowledge in the background that is helpful here. Because a lot of everything you're saying is stuff that I've thought, but I'm like, am I? I, I truly like, am I missing some something in gender theory or something that I'm just hasn't really, haven't really considered? And I feel like I've tried to read as as broadly as I can, but right. um, exactly I mean, what you said about when, when like a more traditional rigid view of masculinity and femininity that's very prevalent in many more conservative churches Mm -hmm. yeah i feel like that that and i don't feel people that do that i don't think they recognize how much they are actually feeding yes a certain trans activist narrative that i Mm -hmm. think is actually unhelpful and this is yeah and 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 it's the gender critical feminists often pointed out like you've trans activists and when i say that i mean a really subset of right exactly trans way of thinking most trans people aren't that um Mm -hmm. uh they just it's like this horseshoe it's like they end up kind of almost having the same view of what it means to be a man or a woman um anyway i'm kind of just repeating everything you're saying but just i and what's so awesome is just biblically um Mm -hmm. i know you're more of a philosopher so i don't know if you read the bible but not just kidding (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> hey yeah you know i am a catholic but i do read the bible i do know the bible well. my, my, my fundamentalist friends listen are like well she's catholic so she probably doesn't read i know so, right yeah. uh, <laughs> that was actually a philosopher friend of mine who uh no actually it was it was a, you'll appreciate this because it was in edinburgh at a new testament conference in uh yeah in edinburgh and the host was the a theologian a christian theologian of edinburgh you might even i forgot his name but he introduces us, he introduced the conference. He's like, I want to welcome all you New Testament scholars. You know, I myself am a theologian, so I don't really particularly read the Bible, but everybody just erupted. <laughs> anyway, biblically, there, there's such a, a freeing, as you put it, of what it means to be a quote unquote man, to be a male, to be a female. You have a lot of males acting in culturally masculine ways. You also have some males not acting mm-hmm. in masculine ways. Jesus is a prime example. I mean, if you look at both the Jewish and the Greco-Roman standards of masculinity, he didn't live up to a lot of that stuff because he didn't care. Right. He was living out Genesis 1 and 2, right? So um, he was a single man of marital age, didn't have kids, wasn't having sex, you know, mm-hmm. um, was uh, reaching out to people of lower social status, washing people's feet who you know right. were lower than... Doing things that the world around him would have considered very unmasculine. Um, mm-hmm. And I mean, all throughout scripture, you see women doing things that go outside the cultural confinement of what it means to act in feminine ways and same with men. And so the Bible is really liberating um, mm-hmm. when it comes to these things. Now, would it be from a biological perspective, the way I've put it, I would love to hear your thoughts is it may be that most males will naturally act in stereotypical stereotypically masculine ways there's even all the way down to the role that testosterone plays on your Mm -hmm. behavior your interests and stuff um but that is a general pattern that will happen it's just not a moral mandate and there's always Mm -hmm. exceptions to the to to that rule so i i I don't want to deny biology because some of my friends mm-hmm. who love when i get on gender stereotypes like yeah 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 but then they almost go too far to almost say yeah. like it, it almost like to diminish any kind of like general pattern of masculinity and femininity or whatever if i'm even mm-hmm. yeah um so general pattern yes always exceptions to the general pattern and there's no moral mandate that males must act must act in stereotypical masculine ways is that yeah how would you re, re, maybe right so yeah i think if you you if you go too far the other direction you basically say oh yeah well men and women are interchangeable there's right. no real difference between them and that's wrong as well that also disregards the body so hmm. one i guess one idea that i'm always working with is that the body matters that the body reveals the person and so I, I very much am working with this kind of holistic and incarnational theology. So the body and the soul, we can talk about them in, in terms of their certain distinctions, but they are one thing, right? Mm-hmm. So that's what it means to be a human being. A human being is a unity of body and soul. Mm-hmm. So the fact of the 
me being the body that I am is going to affect every part of my life, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm also a unique individual and there's no one like me. There's no one who will be like me. And for some reason, God wanted someone like me to exist. And so I'm bringing something totally different from what anyone else can bring. So there's this individual difference, this level of individual difference. And then there's also this level of sexual difference. And then there's this level, uh, then there's the human level. So men and women also have a common humanity. So I think we have to think about all three levels, right? Mm. Because if we, if we disregard, so I think egalitarians like to think on the human level and the individual level, and they kind of disregard the sexual difference level. And then Hardcore complementarians, they like to think on the sexual difference level, and then they they disregard the common human level yeah. um, and the individual level. Because if men and women are both fully human, that means we share in the full range of human capabilities and traits and virtues, right? There's not this like separated list of like, here are the virtues for women and here are the virtues for men. Um, so I think you've got to be thinking on all three levels. Yeah, um, yeah. no, that's super helpful. I, never, I haven't thought about it like that. Um, Gosh, got so many questions. <laughs> what? What? I'm curious. What you are? Oh no, no. I, I wanted to ask this question. It's something you said earlier about uh, biological sex being a social construct. Um, I guess my question: how, um, What do people mean by that? Right. And how do they get? In a sense, I, well, uh, my first question should be: How? How do they get away with saying that? Right. But then I need to back up and say, well, okay, maybe I'm not really understanding what they're trying to get at. So. What are they? Try, can you like step inside the shoes of maybe your former self who used to? <laughs> um, yeah, I know. Right. Got to like, put my little hat on here. Convince yeah. somebody who doesn't know what that means of that reality. Um, and then I would love to hear maybe your more critical thoughts of that. Sure. It just on the face of it, just seems like the average person's like, like, how could you say that? Yeah. What do you mean it's constructed? Like, like right. Like, how did you come into existence again? <laughs> right. Know, yeah. Um, yeah. So let me see if I can give give my most charitable explanation for it. So the idea that sex is a construct is basically, um, there are all kinds of differences among human beings, but it's a, it's a cultural or social, um, power move that has taken a certain, certain kinds of characteristics and clustered them together and put the label of this normative label of sex on them. So usually someone who's arguing from this perspective is going to play the intersex trump card, right? Okay. It's going to say, look, intersex people exist, ergo sex is a spectrum. So as soon as you try to make sex a binary, you're, you're just do you're playing a language game, you're playing a power game, hmm. um, and it doesn't work. So that's usually the argument. It's, it really, it really depends upon the, the intersex gambit. Okay. Um, so my response to that is one, um, inter intersex conditions. Um, so intersex conditions are, it's an umbrella term. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's no third sex, right? right? Sex refers to gamete types. So there are large gametes and small gametes. Um, all sexually reproducing species, not just humans, not just animals, plants, we're talking all sexually yeah. reproducing species have small and large gametes. There's no third gamete. There's no third sex. Um, there are, there are only two sexes. Mm -hmm. So all sexually reproducing species participate in this, um, reality of sex. Now, sexual development in human beings is a process. It's an, an like any developmental process in rare instances, parts of that process can go awry and um, kind of veer off in an atypical direction. And in those instances, um, you might have different kinds of conditions. But what's important to realize is that intersex conditions are variations within maleness and femaleness. They're not exemptions from maleness and femaleness. Mm -hmm. So this, the intersex gambit, like what I like to call it, actually dehumanizes people who have yeah. intersex conditions, because it's basically saying, oh, you, you know, you don't have a normally formed vagina. Oh, you're not really female. Right. right, right. So then again, we're, we're talking about the narrowing of these categories. Um, and I also think that people who have this perspective, they seem to no longer be thinking in terms of maleness and femaleness as reproductive categories. 
they just seem to be thinking about it almost as an as an appearance, huh. right? Rather yeah. than um, what it means to be a female is that your entire physiological structure is organized in a way that facilitates the gestation of life, right? Or the production of large gametes. And if you're male, then your entire your entire physiology is organized in a way to facilitate the production of small gametes. Okay, so that's what maleness and femaleness is. Can you? So I'm when, sorry, to, I have to stop you here because that language is. I've been looking for a precise language. Yes, yeah. and that's really helpful. Can you okay, give yeah. concrete examples of that? I mean, the classic example would be like wider hips for women, or um, just high levels of right. estrogen is playing into their reproduct- reproductive potential. And same thing with men, maybe on a lesser scale. I, and I don't. Right. So so yeah. Can you yeah maybe dig a little deeper there and then and then if you could Mm -hmm. what about a woman who doesn't have kids or doesn't want to have kids or isn't trying to you know this this, is the essence of her womanhood her womb you know um, yeah yes okay so what you're talking about there in terms of say wider hips breasts those sorts of things those are secondary sexual characteristics Right. right so that's kind of downstream of primary sexual sec- second primary sexual characteristics which would be gamete production okay. and sometimes people point to karyotypes right so xx xy mm-hmm. um, and karyotypes are kind of like like the recipes mm-hmm. that you know that here's what cake is supposed to be made all right but so you you can't point to any one of these things and say that's sex okay. sex is all of those things taken together right, right. because sex really is referring to the organism as a whole. And that's something I think that that these activists seem to completely neglect or reject. So they they reject the unifying purpose of all of these characteristics. And so then it just becomes this fragmented list of characteristics and well if you if you can mimic the appearance of enough characteristics then boom you have achieved or you've changed sex, right? right? right. But what sex is ultimately about is reproductive or procreative potential. Okay. Potential. So potential. So this is this is terminology I think that would be really helpful. So that there's there's a difference between potential potential and actuality, right? Or potency and act is the kind of philosopher speak for it, if you want to get fancy. Um, but to be female is to have the potential, the innate potential to gestate offspring. Right. So you asked about an infertile woman. Well, um, Preston, can you get pregnant? Like if you have sex, will you get, can you get pregnant? Not Preston, this year, I'm asking no. you a personal question. So waiting on Elon Musk okay, right. to help me out with that. But. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, but I'm guessing like that doesn't mean you're infertile, right? Like you can't get pregnant, but a doctor wouldn't say, oh, Preston, I'm really sorry. I've examined you. You can't get pregnant. You must be infertile, right? A doctor would never say that. Hmm because you're a male and you don't have that inherent potential to begin with. So even the categories of infertility actually refer back to this inherent potential huh. that is somehow being prevented from being actualized, ah. right? So to be infertile is not to lack the potential. You have the potential, but then something's preventing it from being actualized, right? So that's that's why the infertility argument doesn't fall. I mean, doesn't follow because we have specific definitions of what it means to be infertile based on one's inherent potential, right? So that actually affirms what I'm saying, that male and female human beings have distinct innate potentials when it comes to procreation. Okay. And and you don't have to... You're so good with language. I'm not nervous now. I got to get my terms right. So you don't have to... um, live out or achieve that potential to validate the essence of whether you're male or female. Cause that's, I, I think of women who have right. had like a hysterectomy or, um, right. Or even like intersex females, which again, most intersex people would right. identify as either male or female. Um, and in a sense would be male or female. Um, but you, so you don't have to like your womanness is not validated whether or not that potential is achieved, whether it's through old age surgery, hysterectomy, infertility, or, or singleness. What about a single woman? Single, yeah, it's like, exactly. wait a minute, my potential will never be lived out. Am I lesser of a woman 
than somebody who's married? Um, I mean, the answer is no, right. but I want to kind of play around with that a bit. Yeah, the answer is absolutely not. <laughs> right. So, and this is, this is where I think actually, um, you know, my, my Catholic tradition helps me hmm. because we have such a rich tradition of celibacy, right? Hmm. So, so yeah. many of our saints, um, that we, that we honor in the Catholic tradition, male and female didn't, you know, Jesus, you know, he didn't procreate. Right. So, um, you don't have to, being male or female is not an achievement. It's not like something you unlock or yeah. earn or prove. It's just given. It's part of your nature. And whether or not you ever um, have a child or, pro you know, whether or not you ever procreate is kind of, you know, in a, in a way that's up to God. That's not even really under our control all the time, even though we really want it to be under our control. And so much of the story, I think, of gender in the last hundred years has been about wanting to control mm -hmm. things that we aren't meant to control. Um, and so I think, yeah, you, you definitely don't have to, to have a child to have the innate okay. potential of procreation. But I would also say that, you know, if human beings are a unity of body and soul, then that means there are spiritual dimensions to our physicality. So there are spiritual dimensions to motherhood and fatherhood that can be drawn out whether or not the biological piece is there. And so I think that, you know, even women who are never married, you know, maybe women who are who become nuns um, or who are married, but they're infertile. They can also live out their spiritual motherhood hmm. in various kinds of relationships and interactions. Hmm. And so I think that dimension is something that's really important as well. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's super helpful. Gosh. Um, so I want to I want to go back to. Uh, do I want to go here yet? Well, so, okay. So let's, I, I, I do want to speak more directly to the trans conversation and, and I want to be careful here. Obviously both of us don't identify as trans. We don't experience gender dysphoria. We both have many friends that do. Um, and it's always, you always want to be yeah really sensitive when you're just speaking on a podcast. Right. Conceptually. And yet again, to go back to my previous point, I think there, we, there does need to be a place for sound, gracious, humble thinking through the concepts. As, as right. we just step back and let's just build a foundation of what it means to be human. So homo sapiens are sexually dimorphic. We've already talked about that. There's males, females. Some males or females might have an intersex condition. Some, it might be so severe where the, um, it's, it's really difficult um, to determine hmm. whether they are male or female. They might even live in between this male female space but male and female are still the only sex categories of humanity um mm -hmm. then you have uh the stereotypes of masculinity and femininity that are based upon how groups of males and females act and it would be I, i'm very comfortable assuming the modern definition of gender if we can nail it down to say that gender is a social construct, or at least it's partially socially mm -hmm. constructed. I'm even fine. Mm -hmm. of, of course, gender is not binary. <laughs> if you define gender as your internal sense of self, then there's probably over 7 billion internal senses of like, if, if you want to reduce right. it to this individual subjectivity, then I think it's, this is where I didn't like several things I didn't love about Deborah So's book, you know, he has, she has a whole mm -hmm. chapter on, you know, gender's not binary. I'm like, well, according to your own definition of gender, of course it is, isn't binary. Like yeah. <laughs> now we can protest whether the definition is helpful or not, but sex is binary gender, according to most definitions wouldn't be. Is that, sorry, to, I'm going way off of rabbit trail mm -hmm. here. Is that legit to say that, uh, according to most people's definition of gender, that there's not only two options of internal senses of self? Yeah, well, I think if yeah, I think if your definition of gender is your internal sense of self, then there are as many genders as there are people, because yeah. no, you know, each person is unrepeatable. No one is exactly alike. So that's one reason why I don't think that's a helpful definition, okay. because yeah. and we don't need the word gender. We can just say Preston. Your gender is Preston. My gender is <laughs> Abigail. You know, like what? Yeah. Um, but wanting to but there there seems to be a desire to hold on to the categories of male and female for some you know some yeah. want to want to totally blow it up but um so there seems to be a desire to to, to keep these categories yeah. but then to detach them from the body yeah um yeah 
so okay um so you have sex then you have um some people with intersex conditions and then some some humans experience some level of discomfort distress some body dysmorphia and i do see that as kind of the overarching umbrella category of which gender dysphoria would be a subcategory so some people experience right. distress <laughs> a lot of kids experience distress going through puberty body changes um yes. being too tall too short overweight underweight um there's more severe psychological conditions of body dysmorphia there's body integrity identity disorder where mm -hmm. even having full limbs causes distress and along that wide spectrum of body dysmorphia, there is specific discomfort with certain aspects of biological sex. For some people, it's your upper half, your bottom half, the whole thing. For some people, it's, I mean, there's many variations within specifically gender dysphoria. And there would even be some sexual stuff that might be some people's experience with autogenophilia and, and, and other things. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of just you know, like, like, um, complexity and diversity within even body dysmorphia, but even a subs, the subset gender, uh, dysphoria. Now, some people, um, find it helpful to name that incongruence with an identity. Right. Now, all I'm doing is trying to arrive at what the term trans Mm -hmm. ultimately means just if we just took it out and analyze it on the on on a on a conceptual table um it, so that's i i so i'm just trying to lay all that out now where i think it gets confusing is when that identity which is ultimately built around some kind of uh, identify naming some level of this incongruence where, where i think it gets confusing is where that identity now is elevated to some kind of ontological um uh category of humanity that doesn't really have well it doesn't really have the <laughs> the ontological foundation that i think the when people say the term they think it does i i, I don't want to overly conceptualize here but it, am i as i just kind of analyze the language of our discussion it, it, do you have like what do you think about that is that am i on the right track and have you thought about it in those terms? <laughs> yeah, so I think some the way certain people talk about trans identities does seem to use ontological language, right? So it does seem to be making a statement about being. Yeah. Um, like I, whether they use the language of soul or psyche or inner sense of self, there seems to be some kind of interior reality that's mm -hmm. fixed, that's innate, that's inborn, that is um, that that is somehow sexed, yeah. even though it's not bodily, right? Which yeah. that that right there is kind of like a, red, a little bit of a red flag, right? If if sex is fundamentally a reproductive term, then why would a disembodied part of oneself, interior part of oneself? be sexed in that way, right? So I don't know. There's there's some confusion there. Right. But I think there are other people who aren't making ontological claims that okay. are really just saying like, this whole system of categorizing people this way is a kind of violence and I just want to mess with it. You know, I want to like, <laughs> yeah. I want to, first of all, I want to just exempt myself from it. You know, I'm genderqueer, I'm non-binary, whatever. I don't want anything to do with this system. Um, and so yeah. I don't think though those that kind of language tends to not seem as ontologically weighty um, okay. to me. So I think sometimes that's the more Butlerian stream, right? Sure. So I think where they're almost denying ontology and they're they're kind of saying that these categories um, are are normative and anything normative is is inherently exclusionary and uh, and violent. And so we right. just want to kind of mess with norms. Yeah. Um, and then I think you do have people that um, really feel, as though there's this kind of permanent essential part of themselves that doesn't match the body that they're in. Right. right? And right. then that seems to be making that, that anthropology or that kind of view of the human person then seems to be a, a kind of fundamentally Gnostic one um, right. where the identity, one's identity is really in that interior part of oneself. And then the body can like be wrong. The body then is right. not, 
part of one's essential identity, right? So that's that's a different anthropology than the Christian anthropology. Like I, this is this is where I have not been able to find a satisfying answer. And you know, and like you, even though I do know a lot about this stuff, there are times when I'm like, am I missing something? You know, like I don't want I don't want to die on this hill. And then right, like, right, right. You know, and it's it's a really hard hill to be on right now. And I don't want to be saying things that I know. Um, right. Well, people will find hurtful right. if I'm if I'm missing something, but I can't. I really have not found a satisfying account that reconciles a transgender anthropology with a Christian anthropology. So a, a Christian understanding of the human person, because um, both the kinds of of language that you might hear, um, neither of those fit with a with a with a Christian anthropology. Because if if there's anything that's inherent to Christianity, it's that. It's the incarnation, the crucifixion, the resurrection. I mean, this is the body matters for Christians. It matters so much that like Jesus, you know, God came down in a body and he didn't just like discard it because he was done with it. He like rose it from the dead and then carried it into heaven. Right. I mean, so the yeah, the body matters. The body's a part of ourselves. Otherwise, why why would God have gone to such great lengths to save us body and soul? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't I don't know how you can have a, a kind of Christian anthropology. Now you do sometimes hear a a kind of explanation of trans of transgendered identities that basically is a an argument for an intersexed brain. Yeah. Um so okay, well, you know, it's just some developmental process that goes wrong in the brain. It's like a neurological condition. So the brain is somehow female mm-hmm. while the body is male, right? Um and you know, that's an interesting theory. I think it it fails on several levels. One, there just is not good peer-reviewed research for this. There are a lot of studies, brain, Im- brain imaging studies. The science is very contradictory, even just studying female and male brains. So there, there are a lot of studies trying to prove this, and they have contradictory results. So the science just isn't there. But okay, so that's one big problem. Yeah. Second level problem is even if there were some high-quality evidence um, to show that that say trans identifying male brains look more like biological female brains. Mm -hmm. Um, Even if you had that high quality evidence, there still is the philosophical leap that's being made that somehow an image of a brain trumps the entire organization of the bodily physiology, right? Again, if sex is fundamentally a reproductive category, then why would you say, you know, why would somehow that not carry any weight, right? That's not a scientific Hmm. conclusion. That's you're making a a philosophical conclusion about identity right there. So So anyway, I I was just going to push back, or Mm -hmm. not push back, but play devil's advocate with the whole brain sex theory, but you covered it because, yeah, in my book, I've got a chapter on brain sex theories is, is, hey, let's look at what I think is probably the best. Right. Um, potential uh christian anthropology that would argue for some kind of um born in the wrong body they wouldn't put it that way but born in the wrong body kind of belief if the brain is sexed that's a big if i agree with you i don't you know i've looked at a lot way too much science on it and even the even the best most like legitimate studies that argue for sex differences in the brain. And this is something I point out in my book. They, they still use language of generalities. And even one of the yeah. largest studies explicitly says, now the brain is not sexually dimorphic like the body is. We are talking about statistical averages. So if we say statistical averages, yes, most female brain or females with brains tend to do this and most male, whatever, but those are statistical averages. There's always, and, and again, they're kind of linked to stereotypes, right? I mean, mm-hmm. yep, exactly. It's like, well, this brain right. is more emotional, more agreeable, more all these things. Right. And you're just kind of playing into kind of the st- stereotypes right. of what it means to be a woman. So I think or you end up resurrecting the man is from Mars, women from Venus kind yep. of stuff, which has been, you know, obviously exactly addressed <laughs> by feminists. <laughs> right. And it's, I know that's ironic, right? Because it's one thing that's trippy about this is how rapidly just the field of feminism has changed and yeah. jumped on board with this, even say eight, seven or eight years ago, right? This, 
this brain imaging hypothesis about, you know, male versus female brains right. was just really treated as just junk science and no, no feminist took it seriously. And now all of a sudden it's like, oh, well, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. No, that sounds great. Right. So then I'm kind of wondering, well, do I have a female brain? Like, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't had my brain checked to see what <laughs> sex it is. Right. I mean, it just doesn't. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. I, it did. The body brain thing is interesting. I mean, it, I get to, to, to create a theoretical scenario if we were able to take your brain and your husband's brain and swap them, your brain goes in his body, his brain goes in your body, then which one are you? Right, exactly. And yeah. are you, whichever one you are, are you your body with his brain or are you, did you go with your brain or did you stick around with your body? <laughs> yeah. And I often yeah. went, when, um, just to show typically conservative Christians that there is some more complexity here than mm -hmm. that we need to appreciate. Um, I kind of say that and they're kind of like, oh, I don't, I don't really answer that. Um, but I, but I do, I mean, again, a male and female are embodied categories, even if there are more masculine or feminine brain traits, I think it's unhelpful to borrow bodily, mm -hmm. not to say the brain's not part of the body, but not, you know, Right. Categories of biological sex and map those on, on the brain. Uh, M Milton Diamond, who's a huge advocate for brain sex theory, um, he even has a phrase I quote in my book saying, you know, if you have, you know, this kind of brain might have the emotional awareness of a woman. <laughs> and I challenge my reader to um, go right. ask their feminist friend if they have an, the emotional awareness of a woman <laughs> right well and that's yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah and that's another level that's another layer of a problem with this theory is that it ignores neuroplasticity right so yeah. even if we say that women in general i don't really know what to do with the more emotional thing i think it's like well i don't know i know some pretty emotional men like maybe they manifest different kinds of emotions typically but anyway so even if you go with the emotional awareness thing then the question is, okay, is that, is that just this inborn brain thing? Or does my brain look different because, um, I've adapted to my environment in a certain way. Right. So there's, there's yeah. this complex relationship between nature and nurture, you know, between right, right. the brain and the world. And so it just, it just doesn't, it doesn't work. And it seems to me that it's, it seems to transparently be an attempt to like start with a conclusion and then try to assemble evidence to support that conclusion, which does not seem like a scientific method right, right. Um, way to proceed. Right. So. And yeah, again, I just want to point out how important it is to understand these concepts, because if you are going to, well, if what we're saying is true, then it would seem like, there wouldn't be a real ethical place. Well, and I'm going to, we're, we're going to have to dig in this a little bit, but an ethical place to try to surgically conform the body to the brain. If we're saying there's nothing wrong with the body or if the brain doesn't need the body to conform with it, that the brain, the brain, the interests, the behaviors can be stereotypically unlike how most people in that body act. So you can be a, bi a biological male and say your brain just seems more feminine. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a different anthropology, then you're going to try to correct the body's wrong. It's not matching the brain and there'd be surgical means to, to try to correlate that. Um, but if you're free in a sense to be a mass, a, a more feminine, stereotypically feminine male, then that would say, let them be a, more feminine male and right. that's awesome. And they're still male. They're still exactly masculine right. by God's definition in a sense of what that means to be just male. Yes. <laughs> um, yes, exactly. Do you see, I'm curious and I don't know if you've worked through this. I mean, do you see any place for somebody to transition? It was a, a Christian, a disciple mm -hmm. of Jesus who wants to live a life that is in line with their creator's design um, have you, well, first of all, have you worked through just all the ethics of that? And do you see any, any kind of exceptions to the rule? Uh, that's that? a great question. I mean, that's, this is some, this is a question I very much, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in a position where I'm like, okay, 
right now, yeah. here's what I think. Like, but I'm kind of like, okay, someone give me, you know, prove me wrong. Like that meme, whatever the guy <laughs> like sitting at the table drinking, the, you know, I'm like, okay, prove me wrong. Like show me how this could work. <laughs> so I think, I think medical transition that seems from a Christian ethical perspective to be pretty clearly problematic. So if we're talking about social transition, so we're not, you know, sterilizing the body, we're not maiming the body, you know, um, and that I'm, you know, I'm kind of, that seems to be different, but still even fundamentally, there seems to be a kind of rejection of creatureliness, hmm. right? That there's a givenness to reality and to our bodies that we receive when we come into the world that's not under our control. And I think the the kind of fundamental human orientation to God is this kind of receptivity. Mm -hmm. And so I do think that um, there's, there does seem to be a kind of rejection of that givenness mm -hmm. in a, in an attempt to, to transition to the opposite sex. Mm -hmm. Now um, there's one, there's one man I recently corresponded with and something that he's really leaned into um, to help alleviate his gender dysphoria because we have such beautiful language in the Christian tradition of humanity being Christ's bride. And so he's like leaned into that identity of himself as a bride. Wow. And I think that is so beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. So there is, and you have this tradition as well of mystics like St. John of the Cross. You know, he, he used feminine language for his own soul. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are a lot of male saints who have leaned into this, mm -hmm. this image of, of being the bride of Christ. And so I think I think there's a lot of fruitfulness that can be found there, mm -hmm. right? Because um, there are ways in which we participate in these beautiful, rich metaphors of of masculinity and femininity mm -hmm. that can help gender dysphoric individuals um, be able to kind of embrace who they are and not mm -hmm. reject mm -hmm. the body that they've been given. Yeah. Um, but then to also recognize that maybe they have this unique spiritual insight um, because of who they are that they can also really embrace. And mm. so, so I think that, you know, I think there's a lot of creative um, work to be done in, in that direction. Uh, but I do think that transition in the sense of kind of publicly taking on an identity that really contradicts um, the one's embodiment that there's just there's something in that that seems to that seems at odds mm -hmm. with a christian understanding of the human being in relation to god mm -hmm. um and the human being in relation to the cosmos right so yeah. um so, social yeah. transitioning that that's a tricky one right i mean if a like i've got friends who are you know female and they w buy more you know baggy shirts wear baseball hats have short hair but it's like again they start playing into like is that they're not cross. They're not. They're not trying to convince other people that they are male, but exactly. they are wearing clothing yeah. that is more less stereotypically feminine. But I'm like, if that's if that's, so, but I guess that wouldn't. I don't know if I'd categorize that as social because social transition yeah. would mean yeah. I am taking on some kind of opposite sex identity or non my my body kind of right. identity um, yes yeah so that's kind of what I was working with the idea of transition where you where you actually are like publicly asserting an identity that is that that is a rejection of your sex embodiment yeah. um but as far as like you know I I think I'm I'm pretty <laughs> I I guess I I don't think we should be narrowly policing things like right. hairstyles and you know yeah. what kind of shirts you wear I don't think you can like accidentally socially transition like whoops <laughs> I realize I've been wearing a lot of big flannel shirts you know yeah. like you can go through a grunge phase and it's fine. You haven't like changed, changed gender or whatever. Um, but, and that's one thing that I really like. That's why I'm you know, going back to this point that I think this perspective is more freeing because a woman who looks super butch, butch and wears men's shirts, like she's still a woman, right, you know, right. women aren't these, these like Barbie caricatures, like womanhood is this, I don't know. It's, it's a, it's a more, it's a capacious room. It's not a narrow box. 
And yeah. I find such beauty in that variability. Yeah. Um, one of the things I like about like going to my local parish, you know, I just go to the local parish and there's just this like a swath of random kinds of people there. You see huh. all kinds of body types. You see all kinds of women. And sometimes I think, you know, we're missing, like our culture has ha, now, for one thing, is so focused on idealized images. And I think the internet has had a profound effect on this too. Like we are just bombarded with these idealized images of masculinity and femininity that very few people can live up to. Right. So in that sense, we all feel like we're failing, you know, like when I, when I read definitions of non-binary, I'm like, well, who's not non-binary right. in the 21st century, really? Like if you don't, you don't really fit these boxes. Um, so I think there's something really freeing mm -hmm. in that and really beautiful in that, in that diversity yeah. um, among men and among women. Do you think there's a healthy place for, speaking of like non-binary or even trans or genderqueer to to have to have this identity as some way of explaining your experience like i know um i always get to give the, the examples of just two very different meanings of trans you know like i've got a friend who's wrestles with gender dysphoria it hasn't gone away comes and comes in waves you know and for them, they, you know, to say they're like when they found the term trans, it was like this profound sense of because they're, you know, the female attracted to the women, but lesbian never really fit. And like, who am I? I always felt like an outsider. Then they discovered intersex and they're like, wow, this this is, isn't me, but I can resonate with this feeling just outside of this, the, the norm, you know, then they found trans and they said it was just such a profound sense of relief to have a term that names this incongruence that they experience now for them they're female they took them a while but they're fine with female pronouns uh same name like there's no social there's mm -hmm. no transition at all anymore um but even having that term just to, to to say just to be able to say i'm not the only one there is something out there that you know um that i can that i can kind of cling to and trust me, this person is their identity. And people say, well, their identity is being Jesus. Oh, kid you not. This person has more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Jesus is on the throne of their life more than probably anybody listening. So um, so that's one use. So that's almost a soft use of trans. It's almost like a way to name their experience. Whereas I've mm -hmm. you know, other friends who when they say I'm trans, they mean something like I was born in the wrong body, even though I'm male. I am female. More that ontological significance of I am this um, category. Um do you find i don't know what I'm, I'm trying to like do you do you think there could be a place of helpfulness with some of these identity terms or do you find them to be ultimately counterproductive or maybe it's a case by case i don't know um um i guess i mean you know we're getting back to the conceptual versus pastoral thing right like right. you know i wouldn't <laughs> like go tell this person if they, you know like hey this is what you should be doing you know or <laughs> Um, but I do think the more I study this stuff, the more convinced I am that the words we choose to use matter. Mm. And I think we need to be really intentional about choosing reality based language. Um, so for, for me, I guess I would, you know, I guess I raise that question. Well, what does trans mean then? Like if it's not about um, you know, a, a transition from one gender to another or one sex to another, what is it naming? Right. And so, and then what is, I guess, the anthropology behind that category you're using? Mm -hmm. um, what's the vision of the human person? What's the vision of human identity that's kind of implied in that language? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And is that a kind of worldview that you can um, embrace as a Christian? So that's kind of the question I would I would ask. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that, like, I, I like your dis distinctions, con conceptual versus pastoral. Um, mm -hmm. cause yeah, pastorally. Yeah. You got to meet people where they're at and resonate with their journey. And like my friend, um, whom I'm thinking of, I won't name her name, but she, she knows who she is. <laughs> but, um, yeah, like when she came to Christ, you know, she just could not stand, female pronouns like it's just it mm -hmm. every time she heard she her just yeah. visions of pink dresses and pigtails yeah even though that's not what yeah. the terms 
essentially mean that's often what they have conveyed, especially in her stories. Yep. So for it took her a couple of yes. years before she could even tolerate that. And now she can. Um, right. The term trans has been really helpful. So, I mean, we're all on a journey and there's certain things Absolutely. that are just like, man, it, it could take years before somebody comes to embrace their biological sex. And even then they might go to the grave like my male cisgender friends, you know, who will battle with anger till they're 90 and, you know, <laughs> go to the grave. <laughs> right, just really right. Rest. Exactly. There are some yeah. people that will really s- struggle accepting their male or female identity. And for those who don't have that experience, we, we need to be compassionate. My heart really goes out to, I'm thinking of two people in particular that, Man, the, you know, the gender dysphoria was so severe mm. that, yeah, I mean, suicide attempts, did everything to try to reduce it. Christian, solid, just nothing. And no counsel for them. What church is going to be like, oh, let us help you work through your gender right, dysphoria. Exactly. Like, I don't know what that means. Right. You know, we just were preaching on right. Romans this week. Get out of my office, you know. Um, and that's a problem, right? And a that's, a, problem. that's a problem. And yeah. I just don't. I, so I've got friends who, you know, have transitioned and. While, you know, I've, I've been public with my views on what I think about transitioning, um, but I, I just, my heart goes out. I'm like, like, I don't know what I would have done in, in your shoes. And I embrace you as a friend, as a fellow follower of Jesus. And I just, I don't have, that's really tough. I don't think on paper transitioning is, is, is the answer. I don't think this is, I can't make a good, like you said, I can't make a, a with all the, I can't make a good ethical case for it against all the kind of ethical um, problems. But I, I also want to, like you said, hold it with an open hand. Maybe I'm missing something. This is still a new discussion. And, and just pastorally, man, that, that to have that kind of crippling, debilitating dysphoria, man, that's, that's, that's something else, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. And something I do see, like some, a truth, I think that is signaled in, um, the experience of gender dysphoria is is the fact that human beings are unity of body and soul. Like you, there's this yearning for that kind of cohesion mm. of identity, right? Oh, like there's good. that yearning, and so I I think that is signaling something very true. Um, but but what I think is that's the truth there. But I think the lie there is that the body doesn't speak its own truth. You know that the body is a, can be a lie. I think that that that's a temptation, right? I think a temptation is a promise that can't deliver. And I think ultimately um, trans identification is a temptation because it promises something that can't be delivered. It Mm. promises that you can become something other than what you are. And, um, and and I, I get worried now because there's this huge industry that's fueling this. There's a lot of glamorization of what transition looks like. And, you know, I know you've talked to detransition, detransitioners and I have as well. And, um, I worry a little bit about the money that's fueling this. Um, and, uh, I do think it's very essential that Christian communities become, become places where you welcome people who are at any stage of this, right? Like, and, you know, let's say, let's say someone, transitions and then 20 years down the road you know they're like I don't know I I don't think this is right for me but you know I look at the the medical risks of trying to undo some of these surgeries and that seems like that would be unhealthy for me like you know, you know when you get yeah. and even if even if say this person were to try to reverse some of it they probably would still you know maybe not necessarily pass as their birth sex like you know, I would want someone like that to feel at home in in a Christian community, yeah. right? So I I think we really need to be doing the conceptual work yeah. while also just keeping the doors open, right. you know, and yeah, not true. jumping to assumptions when you see someone, you know, who you're like, oh, no, I wonder, I wonder if they're trans. It's like, who knows? They could be a detransitioner. They could just be a really masculine-looking woman. Like, right. you have no idea, right? So, right. um yeah, it's, it's really tough, but I think yeah. that's, I think that's the road we need to go down to be, yeah. to, to hold on to the truth, but also, um, to, to be loving and, and yeah. open and welcoming. I call it the, uh, kind of a thief on the cross accommodation. You know, I can easily say that biblically speaking, baptism is an essential part of the salvation. Mm-hmm. I gotta be careful here as a Protestant, salvation 
experience. How's that? <laughs> or the Christian experience. Like, I'm not going to say, yeah, it's, you know, if you want to get baptized, that's fine. But it's kind of ultimately like it's a, it's an essential part. Mm -hmm. um, when did it come? What comes first? I don't, I don't even care at this point. But um, what about the thief on the cross? He wasn't baptized. But it's like, okay, if you're hanging on a right. cross, this is an exception <laughs> to the rule. I think God's going to accommodate. And so right. I think scripture gives us all kinds of paradigms for that kind of situation where here's the firm principles laid down, but there's always going to be these, these experiences and situations that fall kind of in between these ethical categories that are going to be hard to navigate. There is, I don't think there's one, any one size fits all. I'm get emails all the time saying, you know, I just, I just found out this Bible study leader, you know, transitioned 10 years ago before they came to the church. And I didn't realize that <laughs> this man is actually a female or whatever. And it's like, I, right. I don't, what do I do? You know, like I don't you pray, love them, right. walk with them. Yeah. I, I can't, there is no, I can't, I'm not going to email you like the black, there is no like, here's how we move right. forward in this, you know? Um, I don't know. I don't think maybe, maybe there's a verse somewhere in numbers that I haven't read that addresses this. <laughs> <laughs> there isn't. I mean, that's why, you know, yeah, that's why we can't just be rules based right. about this, right? That's why I think it's important to be worldview based, yeah. I guess, because, you know, scripture doesn't just give us rules, like scripture gives us an entire way of seeing yeah. ourselves and reality and how we are part of, we're part of creation, right? Like yeah. that's another, I guess, tension I see between some of this really postmodern identity politics stuff is that it doesn't really seem to see human beings as part of the created world. Mm. Um, and so our, like how we treat our bodies, I think is connected to how we treat the earth mm. as well. Like if we're, I just, I'm, I think we need to have this an integrated, integral vision of reality and the human yeah. person. And that's what, that's the, that's what our thinking needs to be within that context. Mm -hmm. And we reason from what we're given. Yeah. Um, but we've got to stay in that context. That's yeah. the thing. We've got to stay under that. Like, I think of it as a cosmos, this like, yeah. we have to stay in the cosmos when we're thinking about this stuff. That's so good. Well, Abigail, we should wrap things up. It's been over an hour. When are you coming back to the McCall? Do you make it back? Yeah, I usually or? go back twice a year um, in summer and okay. at Christmas. Or, you know, I need, I need a snow fix every summer. <laughs> I mean, every winter. I'm like, give me some deep mountain snow. So, yeah, yeah I think we might be going in a couple of weeks to McCall. I haven't totally oh, decided cool. if we're going okay. back this yeah. summer, but. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, that's our, uh, our ski mountain. I snowboard my family skis. So we go to, we get season passes at passes, passes at Brundage every year. It's a great nice. ski mountain. Awesome. Yeah. Cool town. Yeah, You're probably that. the only yeah. theologian to ever come out of McCall. I would imagine. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe. I mean, it's a small, it's a small place. That's yeah. probably true. Well, thanks yeah. so much for being on Theology and Raw. You've given us so much to think about. And yeah, this is one of those all. episodes where I hope my audience is tracking and I hope it was helpful, but honestly, this is just so good for me just to like yeah, balance honestly. ideas off of think out loud and have somebody that, you know, is further along in some of these concepts than I am to, to dialogue with. So thanks for the interaction. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Take care. All right. Bye.